Let, let's uh, prepare our hearts for our service this morning with silent prayer.
Please join me in the call to worship. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God.
gathered here today. We pray that you will blow upon us your Holy Spirit once again. And Lord, we do remember that this day of Pentecost, your church was born. We are your people. We are thankful. God, we go through this life in so many ways through our own strivings, and so many times we rely on our own power. Lord, and here in this moment, we rest. We rely on Holy Spirit to do the work in us that you're wanting to do. Lord, as we hear today, we lift up our hearts to you, our minds to you. We lift up our church, church universal, church denomination, church even local here as we are God, we want to always reflect your glory. We want to always reflect your love. We want to always reflect the purity of heart, soul, and mind that it is to be a community. God, we your people here we lift up the burdens and the praises. Not only printed in our bulletin, but upon our hearts. For those that come seeking your special touch and your blessing, don't answer their heart's desire. As we hear, Lord, we do lift up those that are sick, those that are wondering where the next paycheck will come from, those that have loved ones that are in service around the world and wonder where they will come from. God, we lift up our own hearts to you. And in so many ways, we fall short. Help us always pick ourselves up with your spirit and walk to we walk beside you. God, we lift up the country, we lift up the world. We pray for peace. Lord, as we hear today, we also lift up just the need of our world and knowing you. God, as we remember our church that was born in a culture that was so diverse, in a world that was full of injustice, in a world, Lord, that didn't know you. We hire Holy Spirit and power believers to spread your word. We want to be like that here today. And so God, hear our prayer as we surrender our lives to you once again. As we ask for your blessing to meet our need, us and our need in all these ways. God, as we're here today, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to pray your prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he is not to temptation, but no brothers are evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward and help with the offering?
Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. The Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be back, church, as I said. Uh, it's good to be with you. For those visiting us online, hello to you. Those that will join later, hello as well. Uh, we are celebrating Pentecost Sunday, which, if you didn't know it, turn to your neighbor and say, Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> this is the birthday of the church. Yay! I'm uh, really excited about today. Uh, this is probably something we'll do kind of a little bit every year, maybe grow on top of it. So if you ever do speak another tongue or just can read another language, you're welcome to join us. Uh, but also, it'd be really cool some years. I'm debating next year, I think we should have a birthday cake yeah. and a birthday party. <laughs> sure. I think so. Absolutely. Because today is the birth of the church, and we remember it. Uh, and it's a very special day, of course, uh, for us, as we remember not only the birth of the local, uh, like the church universal, but it also reminds us how we trickle down time, and you know, generation after generation sharing the story to where you and I sit here today and know Jesus because of the church, and the work of the Holy Spirit through believers. And that's an amazing gift, isn't it? You can say it, that's okay. Yeah, it's an interactive today, it's okay. <laughs> well, as we said before, today's Pentecost, and what that means, uh, it was actually, remember, it's a Hebrew holiday. We talked about this uh, last fall. It was one of the big high holidays for the Hebrew people, and it was also called the Festival of Weeks. Now, the word Pentecost simply means it comes from the word 50, from the Greek. So it's actually 50 days after what we would celebrate as Easter. So you do 50 days from that, you get 49 plus 1, you actually end up back on a Sunday. So Pentecost Day is always on a Sunday, which is very convenient. But what's great about Pentecost, in the Old Testament, the celebration that it was, was the celebration of the harvest. Specifically the wheat harvest. It was kind of, again, if you're there, sorry to just reiterate this, but for those that were here with us this last fall, it was like Thanksgiving. And it wasn't tied to any specific event other than it was the harvest time and the people were coming and they were bringing a lot of the wheat in and they were saying to God, we are thankful. We are thankful people. And they celebrated the provision of God in their life with the feast of Pentecost or the festival of weeks. And so it's no great irony that you think about Jesus rising from the dead, meeting with his disciples, and then what? Ascending, and then the disciples sit there, and they wait around. And actually, we're going to talk about, but they do a couple of things. But the Holy Spirit comes upon them and waits until the harvest day to come and to reap the harvest of souls. It's a pretty a great story, and as we uh, read, as we totally understood, right? There was a quick story of. The disciples are sitting there, and they're praying together, they're with together in one place, and suddenly the sound of a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw it seem like tongues of fire separated came and rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And it goes on to talk about how there were people from all over the world staying in Jerusalem at this time, because it was a festival of weeks, it was a big busy time, of course, and all these people were heard this prayer and these people speaking in their own language about Jesus Christ and the resurrection. It's pretty interesting, uh, this last week it's always fun to celebrate the birthday of the church by going to our annual conference, that is. Yeah. If you've never been there, it's a bunch of meetings. If you like meetings, let me tell you, this is your thing. right? You just, and if you like meetings in a very hot auditorium without AC, I got it for you. This is, this is a good thing. I think my brain baked out one day. We were like sitting there still voting at 9.30 at night. And Larry and Mike were with me. And then I was sitting between them. And I don't know how many they got. I was like the like Southern Baptist sweat. I mean, it was like the dripping off me, right? And I was sitting there. And, uh, and man, I got to go back to the hotel room. And I just remember thinking, I feel like I just ran a marathon. Like, I was exhausted, right? And that's kind of a little bit of what conference is like, but it's much better than that. There are things like there's reports that are given and lots of reports and reports. We ordain the new uh, class. We have retirements of those that are moving on to retirement. We celebrate the death of those who have passed and given service to their church through their life. 
We do all sorts of things. This year was a special year because, as I mentioned before, it was a voting year, and specifically it was voting on delegates. And so the lady, if you don't know this, the lay delegates vote their own uh, delegation to go to general conference and jurisdictional. And then the clergy vote their own, and so that was pretty much, uh, we were warned that we only had one day to do it, and that if we fail, we had these little like electronic devices, and if we failed, the electronic devices were leaving, and we had to do it on paper. And so, ever, mysteriously, we ended up finishing. We had a deadline at 10 o'clock that night, and we finished at 9.30 something that evening. So we did get it in. But it was a good time to see friends and family. Uh, it was also, for many people, uh, always a time of searching one's heart and searching what the church is supposed to be doing. Uh, for many people, you know, it was a great time. For many people, uh, it reminded them of maybe the differences that we have in our church. And it's always interesting to come from that event. We normally do it that first week, and normally Pentecost falls right around here. When you do the math. And it's always interesting to come from that experience, but to be thinking in the back of your mind, the birth of this church. And uh, if you would humor me for just a moment, I love what the disciples are doing, waiting for the Holy Spirit. It says in the scripture, before the scripture we just read, that the, they were sitting around in Jerusalem and the hill of Mount Olives and doing on the Sabbath day's walk from the city. And they went up to the room and they were all Peter and James and Andrew and Philip and all the rest of them were there along with other people, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus' own brothers, half brothers that is, a bunch of women that had followed Jesus around. It says they all joined together in constant prayer. I love that Jesus told them, hey, go out. Spread the word. And they pray. And they wait for the Holy Spirit to empower them. Pretty good message for us today. But then I also love uh, what happens is Peter sits there and he says, Hey, Judas betrayed Jesus. He made 12 of us disciples. We're missing one. And so they, they decide, Hey, we do need another disciple. So they pick a man, or they have two men, that is, that have followed Jesus pretty much since the time of uh, baptism to the time of his resurrection. And so they are sitting there, they have two men that they've got it down to, and they don't know who to pick, and so they just say, hey, Lord, choose for us, and they pray, and then they cast lots, which whatever that looked like back in the day, and they just allow God to speak. That's always funny coming from uh, annual conference, because if you've never been there before, there's a lot of like political maneuvering, you know, like there's a lot of churches political too, if you didn't know that happens. And so I've always wondered, like, if I ever made a motion, you know, to get up and say, hey, what if we just pray? Casted lots for our congress, for our delegates. What would happen? You know, like, would the church be cool with that? You know, I always wondered what it'd be like to just roll the dice. Like, okay, number twenty seventy seven. Okay, Bob, you're going to do the conference. <laughs> <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, you know, but there is kind of a point that always sticks with me of the church before the Holy Spirit came was filled with prayer, and they truly believed God was going to answer that prayer. And my experience sometimes at annual conference is coming back and saying, Lord, did you hear my prayer? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes not. But I always wonder, you know, sometimes we get maybe far from what God is doing in our life through many different ways. And not to say we voted wrong and things like that, but I do wonder in our culture how often, when I reflect on my own life, I'll pass an accident. And I'll pray for that person. And then somewhere along the road, maybe somebody knew that person, and I hear a report of, hey, they went to the hospital, and actually everything turned out just fine. And I go, how lucky they were. And I forget the prayer. And to give God the glory. And, only that's, and that, if I'm the pastor, I know other people do that, right? So come on. It's going to be like a deer in headlights. But how often maybe we forget the power of prayer. Amen. And how often we forget that our work is prayer. It's a weight for the Holy Spirit to empower us. But I love this, this verse that comes after because Peter gets up because they're speaking in tongues and it's 9 o'clock in the morning and everybody around them and says, hey, this is pretty cool. And other people say, oh, they are just drunk. <laughs> I always found that interesting that the joy that would come from the Holy Spirit and the overflowing just kind of just, if you get a group of people that are you know, drunk and rambunctious and just having a good time, Holy Spirit made the disciples look like that. And they were so filled with joy that when they were speaking in tongues, the people were like, these people are drunk. <laughs> these people are drunk. 
And what does Peter do? He gets up and he addresses the crowd. And I wanted us to think about the birth of the church and the words that it was birthed by. We've already talked about the birth of prayer and how it was born through prayer. We've already talked about the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what was the message Peter gave to those first people? And I wanted us to reflect a little bit upon that here today to remind ourselves it's the rock on which we are born. It says in this that Peter got up among the crowd and he said, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are, men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In those days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on my people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then he went on to say, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God by you by miracles and wonders and signs. God did among you through him, as you know yourselves. This man was handed over to you by God's promise and foreknowledge for you with the help of wicked men. When you put him to death, nailed him under the cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep hold on him. And David said about him, I saw always the Lord before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will live on in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made me known, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with the joy of your presence. And he kept going. He was a mouthy one, wasn't he? He said, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet. He knew what God had promised him on the oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God raised Jesus to life, and we were all witnesses of that fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he was poured out now on you for what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to Yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool unto your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, the Lord and Christ. The scripture goes on to say that the people were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter, What should they do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized. It says that that day, there were 3,000. At the number of about 120 that it told us previously in Acts, waiting for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I love this passage for many reasons, but one of them, of course, is you took Peter, this gnarled old fisherman, probably, with hands sun beaten and sliced from all the fish, you know, the different uh, scales on the fish and the different fins of the fish and the ropes and the nets that he would constantly have to wash and clean. And he took this man. And God took a man and made him the foundation of the church. And when the time was right, the Holy Spirit had the power to preach a sermon that so moved the people around him. 3,000 people said, I want to believe. And I want the Holy Spirit. I want forgiveness of sins. I want to come into the full and be part of this day. I love this scripture because really Peter's sermon kind of focuses on three big ideas that I think it's important for us to remember as well. And the first is that he focuses on the idea that Jesus was foretold. He speaks about Joel, for instance, and he talks about how this day was coming and the Holy Spirit was promised. And if you really think about it, one of the things that should remind us as the church here today is that we cannot abandon the Old Testament. That Jesus Christ intricately linked, and you can't separate the New Testament from the Old Testament. He was not only the one that was foretold, he was the one that was the lineage, he was the one that was the fulfillment of the end. 
And so as we're here today, we need to never always remember Jesus' roots. He came to us as a Hebrew man in Galilee. And that he lived a life devoted to God. That we can't separate the Old Testament from the New. The second thing that's good about for us as a church to remember what our church was built upon in that first sermon was to focus ideally on Jesus and his resurrection. Did you notice that he only briefly mentions the miracles, the signs, and the wonders, and the teachings? He focuses on this fact. He was dead. He's alive. Amen. Amen. Right? And he even points out, whom you crucified. Just to remind you people here today in Jerusalem, you crucified him with the help of, he says, wicked men, with the help of the leaders of the states and the powers that be. You crucified him. We testify to you. We've seen him alive. And even some of you have seen him alive and haven't come to the realization yet. The foundation of the church, beyond anything else, is the story of Jesus and the resurrection. And that truth needs to be evident in everything that we do. Who we are. That our story never ends with a hopelessness. It never ends with a whimper. It never ends with just going off into the distance into the sunset quietly. It ends with a triumphant, victorious blast of a trumpet when the resurrection is final. Third thing that is good to remember as Peter was speaking here and what he really focuses on, kind of three different things, he reminds us that not only was Jesus foretold, but he is the fulfillment of David. Now, if you just think about that for a minute, it sounds not like that big a deal compared to the first point, but actually it is. Because Jesus wasn't just foretold. He's the end. He's the ultimate omega, if you will. He's the ultimate ending. He's the fulfillment of everything. So our church is built not upon just new teachings, not upon new things necessary that we always learn. It's fulfilled in Jesus Christ the story of his resurrection, that he was the one who was to come. It reminds us that in our world we can turn to many things for help. We can turn many ways. But if less we turn to Jesus Christ, we turn for something that will not help us. So we turn once again this day. This birth of the church, the happy birthday day of the church, to remember these. The Holy Spirit came through prayer. That Jesus was the one that was foretold. That he has been resurrected. He has conquered death. That he is our fulfillment. All of our pain. Let's give thanks to the Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for your scripture and for this day. We remember how your disciples sat there praying and praying and praying. And waited for your spirit. And so, Lord, as we hear today, we know that we're pulled in so many directions. But God, our work is great. We're waiting on you. So, Lord, help us to do that here this day as we wait for your Holy Spirit once again to fall upon us. And God, as we come to your table, we remember the author and perfecter of our faith. This Jesus Christ, who came when the hour was right, when everything was in place, Lord, you sent Jesus Christ to come to this earth. When he came born of a virgin, he came and he lived amongst us. He grew up just like we did. He faced trials of many kinds. It was always faithful. Lord, we remember how his teachings have taught us to love one another and even our enemies. We remember how his teachings have called us to be holy and set apart from this world. We remember, Lord, this day that so many times we fall short. And yet your grace came to you this man. It's God and man and woman. But we also remember, as we talk about here today, the critical point of our faith, the resurrection. It's a God we remember here at this table. And on the night in which you were betrayed, you took bread, gave thanks to the Lord, broke the bread, and he gave it to your disciples. He said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this. Remember to me. When the supper was over, you took the cup, gave thanks to the Lord, gave it to your disciples, said, Drink from this, all of you. 
This is the cup of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in these mighty acts, we remember your love. And we remember how you gave yourself up for us, that you conquered the day, the grave. And so, Lord, as we eat and drink here today, we drink not only in fellowship with each other, but with fellowship with all believers around the whole world that celebrate your risen power here today. God bless these elements that they may be for us, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, that in eating them and partaking in them, that, Lord, we would grow closer to you, closer to one another, and that, God, you would remind us of your holy arms as we surrender to you. God, as we're here today, we repent of our sin. We name before you all the ways that we fall short. But Lord, we don't stop there. We cling to your grace. And we allow your grace to transform us once again. And so, Lord, with the company of heaven and all those who have gone before us, we lift up your name. For holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. As we're here today, we want to let you know a couple of things before we uh, partake. First of all, uh, you don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of this denomination. If you're here today, and you earnestly seek to live with the Lord in peace and live in peace with your neighbor, you're welcome to come and to receive communion. How we'll do that is we'll come down the aisles of the communion stewards here uh, at the front altar. Uh, there will be a chance to rip off a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and then you'll eat it that way. Do you know that we do have uh, someone that will come around in just a minute that if you can't uh, come forward, they'll be able to come to you, so just raise your hand for us, and we'll be sure to serve you. And then finally, I do have gluten-free elements as well, uh, including a cup. And so if you need that here today, uh, just kind of you know, wave us down again, and, and we'll make sure we get those to you uh, so that you can be served as well. Well, the community steward is now comfortable with that. The table is now prepared. That's right, will direct us, but we know that the Holy Spirit truly directs us as we worship the Lord here today.
In Almighty God, sweet Holy Spirit, our Lord and risen one, Jesus Christ, thank you. And thank you for proving your love towards us once again. Amen.